good afternoon welcome to edset network friend today we have another lecture of uh, economic history of finance in india we will uh, talk about the post modern economy and we'll also talk about uh, briefly about Gur uh, gupta economy and for discussion on this very topic we have uh, in a studio dr op singh he teaches history in delhi college of arts and commerce and his keen interest of the economic aspects of uh, ancient india so i hope his knowledge will help us to understand this topic in a new perspective so on your behalf i welcome dr singh for edset lecture welcome sir thank you amrinder ji and good afternoon viewers uh, friends today we have a lecture on economic history of mauryan post mauryan period yesterday we had a lecture on mauryan economy today we will talk about post mauryan economy now when we talk of post mauryan period generally we have an impression in conventional writing that it was a dark age now this impression is in conventional writing or orthodox history writing is because we do not get a continuous history Uh, as we had in the case of mauryan period because during mauryan period we had a dynasty which ruled over almost entire part of the parts of the country but in post mauryan period after the decline of the mauryas we do not get a continuous or uniform history or we do not have a dynasty that controlled the entire stretch of indian land so some of the writings especially conventional history writers have termed this period as dark age of indian history but nevertheless researches in recent years have proved it otherwise and it has now been known as the most flourishing period of history from the economic especially trade point of view so let us see the major aspects of economic history of post mauryan period first now as usual uh, agriculture has been the backbone of indian economy since time immemorial during this period also agriculture remained the backbone of history but there is a slight change in agricultural practices as compared to the mauryan period during mauryan period we had individual control over agriculture along with the state control of the agriculture was we discussed yesterday that mauryans uh, in fact they themselves were directly engaged in the process of agriculture through uh, their officials called sita dyaksha or in the area in the land that was known as sita land which was the crown land so we no longer hear of state farms uh but nevertheless we have uh farms held by individuals which were of course very bigger farms again uh as far as the question of ownership of land is concerned it remained problematic as it was during mauryan period though we have certain newer references in contemporary literature in the form of milind mah and manu smriti where uh, milind mah refers that the individual who clears the land should be the owner of the land and this is also corroborated by manu but practically the situation seems to be different because state had declared all the mines land as state monopoly state made land grants uh, state levied taxes so theoretically as earlier the land practically belong theoretically it belonged to the state but practically the major part of cultivable land in fact belonged to the cultivators only now as i said earlier that uh, since the state itself was not indulging in agricultural practices so we no longer have state owned farms but as far as contemporary literature is concerned we have references in divya vadan buddhist literature of contemporary contemporary times 
of very large farm uh, plots of land and avadhan satak uh, of course i am uh, i stand corrected here references in dev uh, divya vadan suggest of small uh, form pl small plots of form whereas the references in uh, avadhan satak another buddhist literature uh, speaks of very large plots of forms now if we look at inscriptional evidence that belong to satvahana period of the period satvahana dynasty of the period we have some uh, inferences we have some uh, inscriptions of satvahanas which refer that the sizes of plots varied from 2 3 Four, eight, nine, twenty, and even twenty-six nivartanas. Now, nivartana is a measurement of unit, where one nivartana is equal to uh, one and half acre. But in one case, we have a reference where the size of a plot was about hundred nivartanas. So, the interesting aspect about this. unit of land is that we have farm plots of farms which were as small as 3 acres up to uh, 200 more than 200 acres and so on now uh, as far as the extension of agriculture is concerned the practice that started during mauryan period also continued during post mauryan period but here again we find certain shift in the method of extension of agriculture because during mauryan period since the state itself was engaged in the process of agriculture it indulged in agricultural cultivation there was an emphasis that the state should take initiative to bring more and more area under agricultural cultivation whereas during post mauryan times the responsibility of cultivation lies with the individuals so the responsibility of bringing more area until area virgin area under cultivation also lies with the individual peasants only and this also has sanction of the contemporary law books for example manu smriti says that the acceptance of an untilled field is less blamable than a tilled one that is is trying to suggest his brahmin brethren who were generally the recipient of land grants that a person should accept untilled land in as a grant and not a tilled one now he says that untilled grant acceptance of untilled grant is less blamable and when he says so the purpose behind this idea is to bring untilled area under cultivation gautam and manu both gautam uh, dharma sut gautam dharma shastra and manu smriti both suggest that brothers should have separate household now this idea at one level seem to have dividing the uh, dividing a joint family but it may also be seen as individual initiative uh, in the extension of arable land since they will have if they will have different households every uh, household will uh, try to get its uh, daily needs and agriculture will be important in such a process and everybody will be involved in agriculture and since everybody becomes in becomes involved in agriculture the more uh, uh, more and more in such a situation more and more until area can be brought under cultivation now <clears throat> there is a practice that started during post mauryan period post mauryan period we have basically uh, satvahanas in the deccan and north and northwest remained under the control of a number of uh, foreign invaders 
who established their rule starting with Indo Greeks and Sakas and Kusanas and so on and so forth. But as far as central India, especially Deccan, is concerned, it remained under the control of the Satwanas for a longer period. And it was during the rule of the Satwanas that the practice of land grant started because the first inscriptional evidence for the practice of land grants comes from the period of Satvahanas. And here it is interesting to show that the land that was granted was uh, land that was granted during the Satvahana period was normally an untilled land. Now state uh, in fact acted as, uh, as an agent of extension of agriculture at the same time it also protected the interests of the peasants and this was also advised by the contemporary lawgivers to uh, to do so now at least we have at least as far as because irrigation again becomes important when we talk of agriculture and as far as uh, irrigation during post Mauryan times is concerned we have at least two references which suggest of state initiative in the process of agri uh, irrigation and these come from Junagar uh, no, this comes from Hathi Gumpha in Odisha which is an inscription issued by the Odisha ruler Kharvel and the other comes from Junagadh in Gujarat area that was issued by contemporary ruler Rudradaman which speaks of state initiative in the area of uh, irrigation. Now, inscriptions of the period do not refer about the grants of land of administrative grants of land of administrative nature because most of the grants that we see during uh, post modern period they normally belong to religious nature that most of the grants were given to uh, given to the brahmanas or a group of brahmanas or to temples mathas etc etc during satvahana period we at least do not come across any reference any inscriptional reference that relates to a grant which was made in favor of a secular body. However, Manu Smriti states and uh, suggests that land could be given to revenue officials, but the nature and the details of such a grant are not available at least from the Satvahana period. Similarly, we have no information about the amount of revenue that was claimed by the state either under Satvahanas or under the Kusanas. And this however does not suggest that uh, they did not levy taxes on the peasants because if we look at the kind of economic progress that we have, it could not have been possible uh, until and unless the tax was levied upon the peasants. Now, here we have one inscription of Gautami Putra Satkarni who says rather proclaimed in this inscription that he never levied tax that was not in conformity with dharma. This implies that the traditional taxes that were already being collected continue to be collected during Satvahana period because he says that he collected the taxes in accordance of the dharma that is in continuity with the tradition in continuity with the past practices and he said that he never exceeded these taxes now that may be a matter of debate but the details of revenue collection for this period are lacking lacking in contemporary sources however uh, milind paha refers to uh, refers to an official, this official was known as, uh, this official was known as Grama Samik, Grama Samik or Grama Samik, who used to summon the householders through his agents or messengers for the purpose of levying taxes on the behalf of the king. 
So if there was such an official who was responsible for calling, summoning people for the purpose of levying taxes, there is no reason to believe that taxes were not collected. And only problem is that the details of such a uh, nature are lacking in contemporary sources. Now, this period is specially remarkable for uh, the development from the viewpoint of growth and development of different arts and crafts. This is known from various archaeological as well as literary sources, because both archaeological and literary sources indicate that we have a tremendous increase not only in the number of crafts, but also in the number of production that uh, we had during this period. If we look at the contemporary inscriptions from Western Deccan, like uh, uh, from Western Deccan, from Sanchi, Bharahut, Mathura, Bodhgaya and other places, it is suggested in such inscriptions that various artisanal groups like weavers, goldsmiths, dyers, ivory workers and metal workers, sculptors, perfumers, such groups were donors to various Buddhist and Jain monks. Now, as far as the uh, these inscriptions and uh, their uh, script and their language is concerned. Most of these scripts are in Brahmin language except for those in Northwest India which were in uh, Kharosti. But the language in uh, language adopted in most of the inscriptions seems to be Prakrit. Now, in some of the inscriptions of South India, there seems to be some impact of Sanskrit on Prakrit, but most of the inscriptions are generally in Prakrit. That was the language of the people of the masses and the people who have issued these inscriptions after donations of lands to Jainas and Buddhist, uh, Jaina and Buddhist monks, they were uh, the people who belong to the masses and not to the elite section of society whose language was Sanskrit. Now, uh, most of the inscriptions also uh, have been uh, recovered from the railings and pillars of contemporary stupas, images, relics and caskets that, was embed that were embedded in the stupas. Now, <coughs> in western Deccan, there are about 800 Buddhist caves and in the period out of it, 128 contain various inscriptions that were made by rather that were issued by such group of artisans. Jaina inscriptions are found at Udaygiri and Khandgiri in Odisha and 76 inscriptions in caves are found around Madurai which were made to uh, Jainas and most of them are in Brahmi script. Now, inscriptions of the period do not refer to grants of land. Uh, I, I stand corrected here because we are talking about art and craft. Now, evidence from archaeological sources that is found in the form of such inscriptions from various places, these evidence are supported by literary sources like Dighnikai, a contemporary rather a text of slightly earlier period uh, speaks of only two dozens of traits. Yes, Dignika belongs to Mauryan or pre-Mauryan times and in Dignika there is reference of nearly two dozens of traits while Mahavastu gives a list of 36 kinds of workers living in the city of Rajgri. So, there is an increase in the number of crafts being practiced by people from 24 to 36. And Milindpa, which belongs to the end of the post-modern period, there almost uh, there are 
references of as many as 76 occupations and about 60 of such 76 occupations were associated with various arts and crafts. So, this increase in the number of arts and crafts speaks for the importance of arts and crafts during this period. <coughs> now, here there is one more interesting aspect of this art and craft because arts and crafts are have generally been associated with uh, urban areas, but during post Mauryan period, arts and crafts are not limited to urban areas only, because from uh, from uh, Andhra Pradesh in Karim Nagar district. Archaeologists have recovered the remains of residential areas of artisans like artisans and craftsmen like potters, iron smiths, carpenters, goldsmiths, etc., etc. So this shows that how art and craft has penetrated down to rural economy as well, and it was no longer a prerogative of urban areas where earlier the artisans used to reside and arts and crafts were mainly practiced, mostly practiced in urban areas only. Now, among these arts and crafts, mining and metallurgy seem to be quite developed one. Because out of 60 crafts that are mentioned in Milindpa, 8 were associated with the monitoring, with the working of mineral products only, like gold, silver, lead, tin, copper, bronze, iron and precious stones and jewels. Now, bring, uh, brass, zinc, antimony, red arsenic were also mentioned, but the most developed metal technology uh, during the period seems to be the iron technology because this is the technology which had transformed the life of the people, which had transformed the economy of the period and which had affected the contemporary polity and society as well. So, iron during post Mauryan period seems to be the most dominant and most impressive technology and as far as archaeological remains of this technology are concerned, from almost all the Kusana sites in North India, uh, iron implements which were tools and weapons have been recovered from Satvahana region as well in the districts of Karim Nagar and Nalgonda. A number of tools, many of them agricultural and many of them war weapons have been and the, those war weapons and agricultural tools are of very good quality have been recovered from the period. Now, if we believe a contemporary literature which is written by an anon anonymous Greek author which is known as the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. <coughs> It says that, uh, in fact, good quality iron cutlery was exported to Abyssinia, which was manufactured in India. So, this is speaks of the excellence achieved in the iron technology by the, uh, by the goldsmiths of post Mauryan period. Now, cloth making was another important industry and various cities, various centers of contemporary India were involved in manufacturing of different kinds of cloths. Because both Brahmanical as well as Jaina works enumerate the name of the sites and the kind of textile or fabric that was manufactured in the area on those different centers. Mathura was ma uh, important for manufacturing of Satak. Wang or East Bengal was famous for Chom and Dukul. Pundr or Northern Bengal was famous for Dukul and Patron. Magadh was famous for Patron. And Kosambi, Varansi, Ujjaini, Kalinga, Aparant or Kokan, Urayur, 
Madra, uh, Mad, uh, Madurai. These were the centers which were important. These were the cities where which were important centers of manufacturing of cotton cloths. Now, associated with the manufacturing of cotton or silk cloth is an industry that is of dyeing or coloring. So, dyeing industry has been always associated with uh, this uh, cloth manufacturing in industry and we have various archaeological evidence to suggest the existence of dyeing industry. For example, there are at least two places Arika Medu near Pondicherry and Urayur in Tamil Nadu. These are the these are two places which have yielded dyeing vats, dyeing vats or the pots in which cloths were dyed, bigger plots were bigger pots where cloths were dyed have been recovered from Arika Medu and Urayur. Now, as far as the colors used in dyeing industry are concerned, they generally used indigenous material which were extracts from natural products, but some colors like purple were imported as well. <coughs> Contemporary sources have also descriptions of jewelers and jewelry industry. We have references of jewelers, we have references of other uh, artisanal groups like ivory workers, bead makers, perfumers, Pliny. Uh, who has written a lot about India and Periplus of Eritrean Sea inform us that ivory industry was very important in India during post Mauryan times and it was so important and uh, the objects made of ivory were so much in demand in the market in domestic as well as international that the they had to import ivory from Ethiopia for manufacturing of various ivory products. Now, another information that is provided by uh, the Periplus of Eritrean Sea is related to pearl fishing, because pearl fishing and jewels, jewelry made of pearl was another important item that was manufactured in India and that was that was very much in demand in domestic as well as uh, international market. Now, pearl fishing was operated of Kolchi or Korkai, which was on Tamraparni river in Pandyan territory. It was also practiced of the coast corresponding to Gulf of Mannar and Park Strait. Then lower Ganga was another important center of pearl fishing. Pliny locates a third site, the site is that of uh, Perumal or Semila which has been identified with modern Chol which was on the western coast of Aparanth or Konkan. So, pearl was another important item that was produced rather uh, that was that was produced in large at a large number of centers and it was highly in demand. Other items that were uh, in demand and produced in India included diamond which was mined at Korsa, Korsa falls in Berar region. It was also mined for from Sabarai in Sambalpur region and it was also obtained for, from river Admas or river Vaitarani. Semi-precious and precious stones were also produced from different places and they were again in demand in the jewelry industry for making beads and necklaces of beads and such items included agate and carnelian which was obtained from the rocks of Deccan. Amethyst was obtained from Western Deccan, Sadonyx and Onyx was obtained from Satpura range. Now, if you look at 
the contemporary literature. Divya Badan says that son of a merchant should be given regular training to identify different gems and jewelries. So, this speaks of the importance of the semi precious stones in the industry of jewelry making, where it is suggested that the people should be trained sufficient enough to test such things. Vatsyan in his Kam Sutra has included the testing of jewelry as one of the 64 arts that he mentions. So, needless to say, it was a very important uh, craft that uh, was much in demand and it has at it has received the attention of contemporary uh, literature writers as well. Now, associated with arts and crafts is the practice of trade and commerce, because art and craft flourish only when there is sufficient trade and commerce. There is demand of such items and these items are brought in the market in different markets national as well as in domestic as well as uh, international and in fact they are linked to each other. If trade and commerce flourishes it will benefit the arts and craft industry, if art and craft flourishes it will benefit the trade and commerce section. So, this period is especially noteworthy for this trade and commerce activities uh, both from internal as well as external trade point of view and for it we have all type of literature like lit, uh, we have all type of evidence sources like literature, we have archaeological evidence, we have epigraphic evidence to prove that the trade was flourishing during this period. Now, the reason for development of trade were partly due to development in agriculture because until unless we have sound agricultural base trade cannot flourish. So, development in agriculture that all had already started during uh, during uh, 6th century BC that gained momentum during Mauryan period got consolidated during post Mauryan times and a, there was a solid agricultural foundation for such type of economic base. And apart from this development in agriculture, the political changes which were there because of uh, the coming of the Mauryas which brought a number of uh, reforms, they connected, they opened up the entire subcontinent by building roads and by attempting at uniform administration. But at the same time, this was the period when we have a large number of foreign invasions from northwest India. Now, these invasions opened up the route for uh, the Greco Roman world through Central Asia and it opened the route for foreign trade, which was a very important section of the contemporary economic activity. So, in post Mauryan period, we have uh, active and intensive economic relationship with Afghanistan, with Central Asia, with China, with Iran, with West Asia and with Mediterranean. But of all these, the most important trade relations as far as foreign trade is concerned was with the Greco Roman world apart from Egypt of course. Now, as far as the evidence of such a trade is concerned. Now, let us first talk about uh, let us first talk about the internal trade. We have archaeological evidence for internal trade that can be seen in the form of uh, availability of northern black polished ware. Black polished ware was a ware that was used or prevalent in northern part of India and this wear has been obtained from a number of places in Deccan and central India from Kurnul for example 
and wear, especially rolleted wear, uh, manufactured in Deccan or South India, has been obtained from Ayodhya, which is in North India. So the evidence of the objects which were not manufactured locally indicates some kind of relationship, some kind of link and this probably would have been because of internal trade. Similarly, uh, the image of a goddess that has been obtained from Mathura has been made of cyst, blue sister stone of Gandhar. This again could have been possible because of trade links between these different regions. So, this evidence, this archaeological evidence speak in the term of internal trade. Now, as far as the centers of trade during post Mauryan times is concerned, we have several important centers of trade. For example, during Indo Greek periods, uh, Menander, he patronized Sakal, the modern Sialkot, as a very important center, and it was a very important center of trade during the Indo Greek rulers. Now, during Saka rulers, we have centers which were important from the point of view of trade and commerce were Kapisa which is now in Afghanistan, Takshasila which is um, near Islamabad in Pakistan, Puskalauti or Peshawar which is in Pakistan, Mathura. For Kusana rulers, the important centers of trade were Vidisa, Ujjain, Bharukach or modern Bharoj, Suparak or modern Sopara. Prabhas, which is which was somewhere near uh, Somnath, Daspur, which is modern Mansur and Nasik. So we have a number of centers, we have a number of places that emerged as important centers of trade during post Mauryan times, and increase in the number of centers of trade again can suggest the kind of economic development, the kind of trade and commerce that was being practiced during post modern times. Now, for this trade, uh, it was necessary, for this internal trade, it was necessary to have uh, the roots and for internal trade, we have famous Uttarapath route which connected Takshasila and Mathura. But this Uttarapath was again connected by a number of subsidiary or feeder routes, which were one from Varansi to Mathura, the other from Varansi to Vesali, another one from Saket to Sravasti, and another one from Kapilvas to Rajgiri. Then there was a feeder route that connected Vesali to Rajgir via Patliputra and another route that connected. Champa, that is modern Bhagalpur to Tamralipti. So, this network of routes which were, which were part of the larger Uttarapath connected almost all the important centers of North India with each other and this naturally facilitated the activities of internal trade. Similarly, just as we have the famous Uttarapath in North India, we have another important route in South India that is known as Dakshinapat which connected Mahismati uh, in Madhya Pradesh and Amaravati. Now this Dakshinapat was again uh, connected by a number of feeder routes or subsidiary routes. These were one was from Pratisthan or modern Padhan to Nasik, the other one was from Varukach to Soparak and Kalyan and a third one was from Muziris to Kaveri Patinam and Puha. So, this way we can see that the entire country was besetted with various important routes connecting all important centers with each other, which naturally helped in the development of trade and commerce. But it was the foreign trade which was more important and which witnessed in fact unprecedented growth during post Mauryan period and the period is more known for uh, 
foreign trade than the internal trade. Although India had trade relations, as I said earlier, with Egypt already, but the most flourishing trade trade that India had during this period was with the Roman world or with Rome. Now, this trade was conducted uh, through both uh, river and sea route, but till 45 AD, uh, land route was preferred. Now, this there were three land routes. One was the northernmost route, which el went along the Kabul River across Afghanistan mountains. The second lay about uh, about 500 miles from Afghan mountains to the plateau of Kandahar and Herat, and the third route lay across the deserts of Makran or along the coast of Baluchistan, which via Central Asia uh, people used to go to the Roman Empire. But it was in 45 AD that a Greek sailor whose name was Hippalus, he discovered monsoon and after the discovery of monsoon, people generally took the sea route and because it took less time and it was less risky and uh, it was cheaper as well. So after 45 AD, uh, very few people were using land routes and most of them were using sea route with the help of monsoon. Now once the sea route became important, so became important the contemporary ports and during post Mauryan time we have numerous ports in operation on both eastern as well as on the western coast. If we go by the list of the contemporary post, contemporary ports on eastern coast, this included uh, ports on western coast first. Port, ports on western coast included Patala, Barbaricum, Pargaja, Sopara, Muziris, Tindis, Nelsinda, Semila, Mandgora, Togram. While on the eastern coast, we have ports like Kumari, Korkai, Arikamedu, Masoli Patanam and Tamralipti. Now here we see an interesting uh, fact is that the number of ports on the western, co western coast is higher than the number of ports on the eastern coast. Reason being that for trade with uh, the Roman world, the western coast was always preferred as compared to eastern coast. So, uh, so this was uh, the region that we have larger number of ports on western coast as compared to the eastern coast. Now as far as trade uh, in this period is concerned, trade was mainly done in luxury items because uh, it was a, a trade that was between the rich Roman Empire and India. So m the people that were uh, there in Roman world, they wanted the luxury items of the Eastern world. And the main items of export from India consisted spices like like pepper, like cardamom, cinnamon, etc., etc. They also exported precious and semi-precious stones, pearls, cotton cloth. Now, there were two types of uh, cotton cloth one was known as Munakhe, which was a fine variety and the other was known as Sagamot, Sagamoto Jene, which was of coarse variety and both type of cotton clothes were imported to the Roman world. They also exported muslin, they exported indigo, they exported ivory, sandalwood, animal skin, iron and steel. So, this where the these were items which were generally luxury items that were in demand in the Roman world, and these items were directly supplied by India to the Roman world because these were produced in India, and Indian traders took them to the Roman world, or Indian traders sent them to the Roman world, and India directly benefited from this trade. But there was also a trade of transit nature with China 
in Chinese silk, where Indian traders brought silk from China to India and from India they exported it to the Roman world. So this transit trade was also in practice and Indian traders were also benefiting from it. Now in return the Romans sent to India a large number of bullion, coins of gold, coins of silver. In fact more than 130 hordes of coins have been recovered from south of Vindhya alone sacks full of gold and silver coins of Roman origin have been discovered from these areas. Now apart from bullion, the Romans also uh, sent wine amphorae which were of Italian, Lasodian, Arabian origin. They also s exported to India red glazed Arentine ware which was of course uh, copied in South India. Now, as far as balance of trade is concerned, this balance of trade was completely in favor of India. And in fact, the contemporary Roman scholars were appealing rather advocating from the authorities to ban this trade with India because they suggested that Rome was being drained of this, uh, Rome was being drained of, of its bullion and according to their estimate almost 550 million sisters every year were drained off to the eastern world and largest part of it went to the trade with India. So uh, they suggested that this trade should be banned otherwise Rome will be become uh, drained off of its wealth. Now, this from Indian point of view, from the point of view of economic history of post-modern period, it speaks that the Indians were benefiting too much from this trade and the balance of trade was in favor of the Indians. Now, as far as organization of this trade is concerned, unlike Mauryan period, the state was no longer indulging in uh, the organization of trade. It was a completely individual initiative where independent uh, traders, whether individually or making various guilds, which were known as Srini, Nigam, Puga or Sarth, they indulged in uh, trading activities. The people known as Vanik are frequently mentioned in contemporary literature who were responsible for carrying out of this trade which was both domestic as well as foreign in nature. Now Jatkas because, uh, because of importance of trade guilds become important and Jatkas mentioned that there were at least 18 type of guilds during this time. Now Gautam another lawgiver gives them various rights that the, these guilds could lay down their own rules for betterment of their class, their members, their own society. Uh, every guild had a chief. They were authorized to elect their chief and this chief was known as Jetha or Pramukh uh, who, who was uh, assisted by a committee of two to five members and this committee was known as Samukta Hitvadina or Kari Shintak who, look, who looked after the internal affairs of the guild. They not only they not only looked after the procurement of raw material or they did not look after only the sale of the finished product but they also looked after the welfare of its members, welfare of the members of the concerned guild. Now this entire economic prosperity is also reflected in the contemporary period in the form of proficiency of coins because contemporary India has produced probably the largest number of coins in various denominations and in various metals. We have uh, coins of copper, we have coins of zinc, we have coins, silver coins, of course we have gold coins as well because this is the period when gold coins issued for the first time by Indo-Greek rulers in India. 
but what is important is that we have coins made of cheaper metals as well as costlier metals we have coins of a smaller denominations as well as higher denominations this speaks for the fact that money economy had penetrated to the ground and almost everybody was using coins which is a sign of strong solid healthy economy now one more practice that draws our attention during this period is the practice of azri azri is a practice that was earlier not allowed by the lawgivers either in brahmanical system in fact in generally in brahmanical system but what we find that during this period manu has accepted azri as a practice and he allows that there should be different rates of interest for a loan granted to different varnas he says that it should be 2 3 4 and 5% for brahmanas kshatriyas vaisyas and sudras now if a loan is taken for trading activity the rate of interest was slightly higher and it was it varied from 15% to as high as 60% 60% interest was taken on a loan which was taken for the purpose of maritime trade because the risk involved in maritime trade was higher and the chances of recovery were less so in such a situation the rate of interest was high now contemporary lawgivers whether is gautam or vishnu or manu they all agreed that the interest amount should never increase the principal amount however practically this doesn't seem to be possible because there are instances when the uh, when the interest amount exceeded the principal amount and they were they were extracted with all sort of rigor now these are the general features of morian economy post morian economy when uh, we have a situation that uh, state is no longer involved in trade and commerce state is no longer involved in agricultural practices but nevertheless state it, state is promoting it and we have a flourishing thriving economic system in which trade engine trade is increasing we have number of cities coming into existence so our urbanization also increases we have profuse use of coins during this period so the tag of dark age of indian history should be removed from post morian period and it should be called a period of flourishing economy now when we come down to gupta period there seems to be slight change in the general features economy that we witness because the practice of land grant that started during post morian period started gaining momentum gradually of course it was not very frequent during gupta period as well but practice that started during satvahana period it became more uh, wider more popular during gupta period and now we have more and more examples of land being granted to various beneficiaries but still what is interesting to see that this land is still being granted uh, to religious bodies only though there are certain instances uh, from deccan where a few examples suggest that land was granted to the officials in lieu of their salary but then still it was not a general practice which became later on during post gupta times but what is important that the frequency of land grants increases and every one starts granting land and this of course ultimately in the decrease of the size of plots because since everybody wanted to grant uh, wanted to grant land because it was associated with the religious benefits which will benefit the forefathers and the donor as well so everyone one 
everyone wanted to grant some land and that led in the decreasing size of plots fragmentation of plots and increase in the number of land grants also led in the increase in the number of intermediaries because a land was granted to a person to cultivate it or get it cultivated these were mostly religious grants agrahar grants devadan grants given to brahmins given to temples now a brahmin or temple official will never indulge in agricultural practices what they will do they will give it in turn to somebody else who will cultivate it and share the fruits of this agriculture with the with the temples or the or the brahmanas whatever the case may be now this led to increase in number of intermediaries and gradually when the land was being granted for uh, officials in lieu of their salary uh, it uh, it laid a number of burden on the peasantry now as far as taxes are concerned we uh, we do not have as exhaustive a taxation system as that of the mauryas because the number of maurya during the mauryan period the number of taxes was much higher now so many taxes are not mentioned in contemporary gupta literature but if we look at the vakataka rulers at at one of the inscriptions of vakataka ruler of uh, deccan we find certain new taxes like uh, upari kar like sulk like kipt like kipt which seem to have increased during gupta times as well and none avail- availability of the name of taxes or less number bar of taxes however does not suggest in any way that the burden burden on peasantry was less and this period because of land grants and associated features of land grants which had its political implication which had its social implication of course being from uh, of course one of important implications being economic implication it over a period led to the system of assist to this led to the origin of self sufficient economic units which are known in indian history as jajmani system which flourished developed in post gupta times and ultimately helped in the development of uh, so called indian feudalism so it's all about more post modern economy and some of the basic features of the gupta economy that i shared with you thank you so much so the before this uh, land grant was started that was the land was owned by the state this practice started you see the ownership of land in ancient india has been a very big question okay. it has never been answered very really, very clearly because there are certain instances like a peasant who owned it who cultivated it who could sell it who could gift it who could grant it also okay so it, uh, so in this way it seems that the land belong to the peasant mm-hmm. but on the other hand if you have a state which got a share in the produce of the peasant mm. there is a state who could grant any land to anybody okay now such rights suggest that on some people suggesting that it was state or the king who owned the land because there is very uh, diff- less there is no difference between a state and uh, the king in ancient or medieval times mm. on the other hand there is one group of historians who suggest that it was the peasant who owned the land but the situation is not clear because none of the sources clearly mention when uh, about the ownership of about land. the ownership because when we talk of vedic period there was an instance when one king called bali performed a sacrifice and then he said that he is granting is twist everything the entire earth to the brahmanas okay. and then it is suggested that goddess earth appeared and he told to the king that listen o king you cannot gift me because you have no control over me you have no authority over me manu suggests that the land belongs to him who first clears the land clears the forest and plows it and yeah. the deer deer belongs to him who first pierces it with his arrow mm-hmm. but on the other hand 
you have instances where the king is known as mahipati mahut mm. mahipati literally means what mahipati literally means owner of the land owner of the earth he is also known as bhupati he can grant he can donate any piece of land to anybody at uh, his will so this is a complex situation which was not clear in any of the sources till you can say till 1793 Uh, when uh, cornwallis brought this zamindari system in india permanent settlement and it was for the first time clearly mentioned in the documents that the owner of the land is zamindar okay so um, well friends in a two lecture we try to find out the dominant feature of uh, ancient economy and uh, how it worked and as uh, you came to know that the uh, land ownership was not so defined and there were other activities economic activity how that uh, uh, helped the prosperity uh, in uh, becoming prosperous and shape the uh, economic situation of the country this all we came to know and in another uh, lectures we will uh, come to know about the uh, economic activities of uh, uh, medieval india and modern india so i hope uh, today lecture uh, uh, this today lecture will be the foundation stone for understanding those lectures so with this word we would like to end the lecture i thank all of you for watching the lecture and on your behalf i thank dr op singh for giving such a wonderful lecture thank, thank you very thank much, you much. Mm-hmm.